If you have your Bibles and you'll join me in Luke, the 22nd chapter, we're only going to be using today two verses. Two verses, verse 31 and verse 32. Luke, the 22nd chapter, verses 31 and verse 32. Amen. All this activity has got me losing some weight. I'm wearing pants that are two sizes smaller than I was wearing, and they're still wanting to fall on me. So, so uh, that's a good thing anyway. I can use that. Amen. Luke chapter 21, verses 31 and 32. I'm going to talk to us today on the topic. It's a long title. The five most powerful words ever spoken by the Lord on prayer. The five most powerful words ever spoken by the Lord on the subject of prayer. Luke 22 verses 31 and 32 reads in this fashion from the King James text. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Amen. The five most powerful words ever spoken by the Lord on prayer. Our first service, uh, at least being broadcast here from Alabama. This is our first time. I thought there was no more appropriate a subject for our first service in Alabama than the always important subject of prayer. If you bow your heads with me a moment, Master Savior. Redeemer King, we love you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the encouraging, uplifting presence of the Holy Ghost that we have felt in this place. Lord, this has been a hellish couple of weeks. We've been going through trials and tribulations, struggles and fires like we've never gone through before. The enemy wants to hinder he wants to delay. He wants to do everything in his power to prevent the message that is preached from this pulpit reaching people in Huntsville, Alabama and the surrounding area. He wants to prevent, Lord, this message, which is a message of affirmation, a message of reconstruction, a positive message, Lord, that truly honors the title gospel, which is in fact today good news. Good news for all who will hear it. As the word of God most must go forth at this moment, I pray, O oh God, that you will anoint the messenger. Help me, Lord to deliver this word in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. Help me, O oh God, to do it justice, to deliver it as you have placed it in my spirit for the people of God. We need to understand today, O oh God, this important lesson. O oh Master, today, let every hearer be blessed, be encouraged, be built up, be inspired, let their faith grow, Master, in response to this word from heaven today. For we ask it in none other than Jesus. Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Many today who do not understand the nature of prayer and those who do not appreciate the power of prayer hear and think the words, 
I have prayed for you, or I am praying for you, or I will pray for you, are meaningless. I'm going to tell you something. Growing up in the Pentecostal church as I did, honey, there ain't no words that I appreciate hearing more from a sincere soul than I'm praying for you. I'm going to tell you. There is nothing like an old-time saint that you know, you know they know how to pray. You know they know how to touch heaven. Glory to God. You know when they get down on their knees, they're not getting up until heaven is shaken and God is moving on your behalf. There is nothing like hearing old sister now or old sister so-and-so say, I've been praying for you. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, every time some of these old-time prayer warriors utter those words in my direction, I want to tell you, I get goosebumps. I get chills because I know the power in prayer. But the word of God said, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The problem is sometimes the wrong people are praying. <laughs> the word of God said, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What does that tell you? That tells you if they're not righteous, they can pray all they want to. They're not going to be very effective. What is a righteous person? A perfect person? A sinless person? A person that does no wrong? Nope. But it's somebody who struggles and strives and tries to do right in their life. Amen. They can be as imperfect and sinful. They can have as many weaknesses and faults as you please so long as they struggle and strive to do right. Hallelujah. Then in the eyes of God, they are righteous. Hallelujah. If their faith is intact and they're leaning on the grace of God, if they're believing that what's going to get them into heaven so they can face Jesus eye to eye, if they're believing that it's their faith, that's going to get them through the gate. Faith in the grace of God. His love. His mercy. His response to our belief. If that's where their faith is, then they're righteous in the eyes of God. A righteous man's prayers avail much. But listen to me, children. It's sometimes the wrong people are praying, but then sometimes the right people are praying, but they pray wrong. <laughs> They don't know how to pray. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Not only do you have to have the right person pray, but they got to know how to pray. If every time they get down to pray, they're whispering in God's ear like God's going to get terrified and jump out of his skin should they raise their voice, I don't want them praying for me. I want somebody who knows how to pray effectively. I, know, I want somebody who knows how to pray as though they are concerned about that which they're praying for. God wants us to come to him. Listen to me. The manner in which you come to God conveys how much you believe God is real. Did you hear what I just said? The manner in which you come to God conveys just how much you believe God is real. Oh, there are a lot of people love to sit in judgment of us Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, tongue talking people. They love to sit in judgment of us because after all, our worship is noisy and our worship is vibrant and demonstrative. And we even pray in a loud and demonstrative manner. And they don't think that's necessary. Well, you know what? I'm sorry for you that God isn't real enough to you. I'll tell you what is real to you though. It is real to you when you go to a ball game and watch a guy carry a stick and football across a white line painted on grass. Oh, that's real for you because all of a sudden you're jumping and yelling and screaming and hollering. Oh, you're putting all kinds of effort and enthusiasm into what you're doing then, aren't you? Or some of our young people, oh, you can go to a concert, you can watch Mariah, you can watch Beyonce, you can watch some of these big 
pop stars and boy I mean to tell you let them start singing your favorite song and all of a sudden you're on your feet with your hands waving in the air screaming at the top of your lungs but God help us Pentecostal Holy Ghost filled baptized in Jesus name tongue talking loud worshipers God help us because after all we're doing what is not necessary we're doing what is unneeded we're doing things that they just don't see uh no wrong wrong well tell you something the way you come to god the way you worship god the way you pray demonstrates how real god is to you my aunt susan with my father's sister wasn't raised in church when my mother and dad started to date my grandmother and my mother invited some of his siblings if they wanted to go to church. My grandmother was an evangelist. I'm going to tell you right now. She didn't preach, but boy, that lady, every chance she got, she was inviting somebody to church. I'm going to tell you something. Some of us should take a lesson today. We got people online watch us every Sunday, and I wonder how many times do you recommend somebody else watch us? How many times do you send a link to a message and say, you really need to listen to this message. You really need to hear this preacher. You know, how many times, obviously you can't invite them to come with you to church because you live too far away. But the least you can do is encourage others to watch and listen and see what we have to say. My grandmother was constantly inviting people to church. And honey, she'd drive a hundred miles out of her way if she thought somebody might come to Jesus. She would drive and pick them up. I kid you not, I, growing up as a kid, seemed like my grandparents, my grandmother was always driving somebody to church. She was always picking somebody up for church. My grandmother invited, through my mom, invited some of my father's siblings to come to church. Well, they'd never been to a Pentecostal church in their life. As a matter of fact, they'd never been to any church in their life. And my Aunt Susan told me years and years and years later, she married and her husband had been married before and he had a daughter who was an adult woman. <clears throat> and my Aunt Susan said, you know, Chuck, she said, we don't go to church regular and probably we should. She said, but we do. We go to church on Easter and we go to church on Christmas. She said, those two holidays, we feel like we need to at least make the effort to go to church. She said, I'm going to tell you something. She said, I wouldn't go to any kind of church but a Pentecostal church. She said, you couldn't get me to go to another kind of church for all the money in the world. And I looked at her and I was so shocked to hear my father's sister saying this, you know. She said, yeah, she said, I'll tell you what, she said, when I was growing up as a kid and your mom and your grandma used to take us to that church out there in Wolcott, Connecticut, Brother Tatlock's church. Brother Tatlock had a shouting, dancing in the aisles, Holy Ghost filled Pentecostal church, an independent church out in Wolcott, Connecticut. And Susan said, boy, when your mom and grandma used to take us out to that church, she said, I'm going to tell you, the way those people worship, the way those people pray, she said, you know, you could just feel their sincerity. You could feel that their faith was real and that they genuinely believed what they were hearing and what they were singing about and what they were preaching. She said, you could feel their faith. You could feel how real their walk with God was. So don't tell me that your walk with God and how real God is to you is not demonstrated in the way you pray and demonstrated in the way you worship. I know that it is because the Word of God tells us it's the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man that avails much. And I'm going to tell you, there is nothing sweeter than hearing a dear old saint of God that you know is living this thing. Not somebody who's playing games with God. I'm going to tell you something. When I, I've been pastoring a lot of years. It isn't hard for me to tell between those who are playing and those who are living it. 
And I'm going to tell you, I've had a lot of people who are playing the game, and they'll say, oh, well, I'm praying for you. And I, I say, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, okay. And to be honest with you, God forgive me, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, big deal. Your words, if they're spoken at all, because first of all, I don't hardly believe you're really saying anything. <laughs> Number two, if you do, they're bouncing off the ceiling, because you're not even trying to live this thing. But then you get an old saint. I don't mean their age is old. I mean they are mature in the Lord and they understand how this thing works and they're living for God and they're doing everything they can to live for the Lord and to be a witness and a testimony to a lost and dying world. And you get that old saint who looks at you and says, I'm praying for you. And boy, I'm going to tell you something. That just sends send shivers down your spine because you know that old saint knows how to touch God. You know that believer knows how to grab hold of the horns of the altar and I mean wrestle with the angel of the Lord until blessing comes, till an answer comes. Hallelujah. Oh, I love that. A lot of people in our world today, including a lot of Christians, they hear the words, I'm praying for you or I will pray for you or I have prayed for you and they don't think those words mean a whole lot. They say, yeah, well, that's the least somebody can do. No, it's not. Not if it's somebody who knows how to pray. Not if it's somebody who effectively can pray. I want to tell you today, in our primary text, Luke 22, 31 and 32, the Lord Jesus Christ declares to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. I'll tell you, there are so many truths in the Word of God that we miss on a regular basis. We read it, and we read through it, and we read over it, and we don't even understand what we're reading. The Lord just told Peter, the enemy, whoo, glory, listen to me, the enemy has to get permission to lay hands on you. Didn't you hear what Jesus said? He said, Satan hath desired to have you. To sift you as we. Satan's appeared before the throne and asked if he couldn't have access to you. So he could sift you as we. Oh my Lord have mercy. <laughs> but then look at the next five words. The most powerful words that Jesus the Christ ever spoke on the issue of prayer. But I have prayed for thee. I have prayed for thee. I have prayed for thee. In modern English, I have prayed for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, honey, you ain't going to get a more powerful endorsement of prayer than the Lord Jesus Christ saying, I have prayed for you. Well, I'm going to tell you, Jesus don't do things that are worthless. Jesus don't waste his time. He doesn't waste his effort. He doesn't waste his breath. Everything the Lord did in the flesh, he did as an example for us. When a movie star, an actor, an actress, a singer, someone famous that we admire and appreciate, when they get on television and say, try this product, I use it myself. It's wonderful what happens. People run out by the thousands to buy that product. Am I telling the truth? Why? Because it's received an endorsement. Am I telling the truth? Yes, it gets an endorsement from somebody they really admire and they appreciate. Man, if Cher recommends it, I'm going to buy it. That's all I know. If Beyonce is in the ad, I'm going to go buy that perfume. If Julia Roberts is in that ad, then I'm going to go buy that product. Am I telling the truth? All because somebody famous, somebody we admire, has endorsed that product. Well, honey, I've got news for you. Jesus endorsed prayer. Hallelujah. He endorsed prayer when he said, I have prayed for you. Hallelujah. Oh, that Jesus can pray, then you better good and well know you and I need to pray. Hallelujah. 
Oh my Lord, have mercy. You will never in a million years find any other soul in the Word of God who endorses prayer, and that endorsement means more than the Lord Jesus Christ. My word, do you ever think about it that way? Probably not. Amen. In John chapter 17, verses 18 through 21, the Lord Jesus Christ is standing at the burial place of a friend named Lazarus. And it is at that tomb, he's asked the stone to be rolled away. And then for a moment, he steps aside and begins to pray. And these are some of the words that we see him saying, as recorded by the Apostle John. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so, even so have I also sent them into the world, meaning those that believed on him. He said, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm mistaken. This is not yet when he's standing at Lazarus' tomb. That comes next. Oh, my mind is tired. Work with me, folks. Amen. The Lord is praying in this instance. I'm sorry. The Lord is praying. And these are words that John recorded him as praying. And he said, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, meaning his apostles and disciples. He said, But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Jesus just prayed for you. Jesus, hallelujah, the Lord of glory just prayed for you. He 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 prayed for me. He prayed for us all. Hallelujah. He said, I'm not just praying. Oh, glory to God. He said, I'm not just praying for the disciples and the apostles that I have here in front of me. He said, but I'm also praying for those which shall believe on me through their word. There is no one believer in the church that doesn't believe the gospel except that they believe the word of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Am I telling the truth? Oh, hallelujah. Jesus just prayed for you and I. Oh, my goodness, have mercy. I'm going to tell you, if there is anything in the world that sometimes brings me comfort, I have to remind myself, especially when I'm frantic and losing my mind, which happens more often than I care to admit, but I have to remind myself sometimes, hey, 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 calm down. The Lord has prayed for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. But now listen to this. This is what I love. The Lord not only prayed for us, but listen to what he prayed. This will tell you what is highest on his list of priorities for believers. He said, I have prayed not for these, but for those that will believe on me through them. He said, that they may be perfect and sinless. Nope, doesn't say that. That they may too walk upon the water. Nope, doesn't say that. Listen. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. <sighs> wow. Wow. What's highest on the Lord's list of priorities? That his people not be divided, that they not be arguing and, and disputing and having all kinds of debates and all kind of malice and negativities and all. So I pray that they be one, even as we're one. 
Your thoughts are my thoughts, and my thoughts are your thoughts. Oh, he said, you know, the world will believe that you've sent me how? When the church acts like I do, when the mind of Christ is our mind, and our mind is the mind of Christ, hallelujah. When we're thinking like Jesus thought, every thought in his head came from the Spirit of God. Every action he did came from the Spirit of God. The Lord said, that's what I'd like to see. That's what I'm praying for. That's what I'm hoping for, that my people will be one even as we're one. That they will merge into us, that they will merge into the Creator and the Savior in such a manner that they will have the same relationship in this world with God that I have. The Spirit of God dwelling in me. Everything I do, everything I say, every action I take is driven and directed by the Spirit of Almighty God. That's what the Lord wanted for His church. Everything the Lord did for us I told you a moment ago, he did for us as an example. Every word he prayed was prayed so that we might hear how to pray and what we ought to be praying for. In John chapter 11, this is the passage I was speaking of a moment ago at the tomb of Lazarus, my mistake earlier. The Lord is standing at the tomb and the word of God said then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said father I thank thee that thou hast heard me what you hadn't said nothing yet I thank thee that thou hast heard me and I knew that thou hearest me always. Listen. But because of the people which stand by, I said it. Everything he said, everything he did, he did for a reason. It's not because he needed to say it. It's not because he needed to do it. Why? Why? He's saying, I thank you, you heard me. I hadn't even said nothing yet. That conversation must have gone on in his head. That conversation must have gone on internally. Am I telling the truth? He's thanking my father for hearing him, and he hadn't said a word yet. He says, and I know you always hear me, but because of the people which stand by, I said it. So he said, I put it to words, because if I don't voice it, if I don't voice it, then those around me are not going to be privy to it. They're not going to hear it. And I need them to hear it. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Oh, you understand everything the Lord did, everything the Lord said, He did and said as our example. He said that they may believe that Thou hast sent me. In our primary text today, it's important to notice that the Lord did not ask for Peter to be kept from falling. You notice that? But rather that he would do two things. That he would keep his faith. Three things, really. Find his way back and then use his experience to strengthen the brethren. He said, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. You may fail in your actions. Your behavior may fail. Your actions may fail. What you do may fall short, but keep your faith intact. Hallelujah. That's why I try to tell every believer that will hear me, LGBT and otherwise, don't let anybody take your faith. Your faith is the most important position that you have. Ain't nobody going to take my faith. Amen. When I came out and away from the church back in 1989, 
I thought the Lord hated me. I thought I was this disgusting, terrible animal, and God didn't want nothing to do with me, and I was backslidden, I was out of church, and I never thought I'd ever darken the door of a church again. But you know what? Those three years I was out of church, when I'd get into trouble, when things would get tough, and I'd be struggling and having a hard time, do you know what I did, Tommy? I went into my room, I got down next to my bed, and I started to pray. And I started to cry out to God. I started to ask Him to help me. I started asking Him to intercede and intervene for me. Why? Because my faith hadn't failed. Oh, my actions may have failed, but my faith didn't fail. Hallelujah. I still believe. I still believed everything I ever believed. Glory to God. God was still real to me. Jesus was still the Savior, the Redeemer, the friend of sinners. He was still the one that I could go to and find help in time of trouble. That never changed. I'll tell you, there's a lot of people watching me right now. A lot of you folks out there right now, you're watching this and you have given up on church and you've given up on God and you decided that uh, too many Christians have been hateful. Too many believers have mistreated you. Too many pastors have abused you and you just can't take it anymore. Honey, I understand that. Believe me, I do. There ain't nobody on this planet been down that road further than I have, okay? But I want to tell you something. Don't you let the enemy take your faith. Jesus prayed for Peter, not that Peter would not fail. Isn't that funny? Isn't it funny he didn't say, I prayed for you so that when the enemy does try you, because apparently what? What is apparent by the string of statements the Lord makes to Peter. Well, what's apparent is, number one, the enemy has to get permission. Number two, he was given permission. Because the Lord now says, but I've prayed for you that your faith fail not and that when you return, when you are converted, when you are restored and you come back, he said, strengthen the brethren. So what does that tell you? He said, well, the devil needed permission. I gave him permission. And you're going to fail. You're not going to be able to stand up through this trial. You're not going to be able to do what ideally you ought to do. But that's okay. Oh, hallelujah. Aren't you glad today that heaven is not dependent on us being perfect? Aren't you glad today that heaven is not dependent upon us being sinless? No, it's dependent upon us keeping our faith. He that believeth unto the end shall be saved. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, it doesn't matter how many times you trip. It doesn't matter how many times you fall. It doesn't matter how many times you backslide or slide backward and then find yourself back in the altar. It does not matter today how weak you are, how human you are, how full of weakness you are, or how overcome by fault you may be. The truth of the matter is today, what is going to save us is going to be our faith. So therefore, the most important thing for us to do is to keep our faith. The Lord said to Peter, I prayed for you, Peter. What? You didn't pray for me that I wouldn't fail? You didn't pray for me that I wouldn't deny you? You didn't pray for me that I wouldn't abandon you in your darkest hour. You didn't pray for me that I'd be able to stand up to the scrutiny of unbelievers and sinners, that I'd be able to acknowledge I was your follower. You didn't pray that I wouldn't do all those things. See, I'm going to tell you, if ever there was a lesson in learning how to pray for the right things, here it is. Mm. How many times a believer sees a mom, a dad, a grandma, a grandpa sees their child, their grandchild going down a path and oh, they're going to wind up out of church. They're going to wind up backslid. They're going to wind up doing things they ought not to do. That's okay. What you ought to be praying for is that their faith fail not. As long as their faith stays intact, they can find their way home. 
Oh, hallelujah. Did you hear me, children? As long as their faith stays intact, they can find their way home. The problem is we got Christians in the world today, Christians, so-called Christians. They're not Christians in reality. They're Christian in self-proclamation only because they go out of their way to attack people's faith. You can't be a Christian and do this. You can't be a Christian and do that. You can't be a Christian and be this or be that. And they go out of their way to convince people that their faith, listen to me, that their faith in the gospel, that their faith in Jesus Christ, that their faith in the cross, their faith in the blood, their faith in the resurrected Lord is worthless because of who they are or because of what they do or how they do it. Am I telling the truth? Oh, I'm going to tell you something, fool. Don't you tell anybody that lying sack of garbage. Don't you tell anybody, anybody, anywhere that their faith is contingent upon their actions. No, their faith and their actions are divorced one from another. They have nothing to do with one another. We can act wrong and still believe right. Right. Oh my Lord have mercy. Now does that mean the Lord wants us out there acting wrong? No. He wants us to do the best we can to act right if I tell the truth. But when we are overcome by a moment of weakness, when we are overcome by a moment of temptation or trial, my friend, that is where the grace of God steps in and fills the gap. Hallelujah. And creates a bridge for us where we would otherwise fall into a precipice of destruction. My Lord, have mercy. So often we think that we must pray for people so that they don't trip or they don't fall. But in reality, tripping and falling can be an important part of the learning and growth process. Oh my goodness. Prayer is not bound by space or time, children. Listen to me. Prayer is not bound by space or time. What do I mean by that? I mean, you, prayer is not confined to this moment. You can pray for somebody today, and that prayer will wind up benefiting them 30 years down the road. Oh, my goodness. You can pray for somebody today and they'll reap the benefits of it far later because it's not about when they're going. You don't have to pray for them while they're in the fire. No, every prayer you pray for them winds up being applied by God when it is needed. Oh my goodness, have mercy. I love this principle. I love this principle. One of the things that I love about good old-fashioned Holy Ghost-filled church. One of the things I love about Spirit-filled people who know how to walk in the Spirit, there's this thing that we call, people sometimes get a burden for another person. What that means is the Spirit of the Lord will kind of lay a sensation of heaviness on another child of God on behalf of another believer. And all of a sudden you'll feel this heaviness come over you concerning sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so. And you don't know what it is. You don't know why it is. You, you don't know what the situation is. But it's like the Spirit of the Lord is letting you know, hey, hey, there's trouble over here. You need to pray for this person. And when you get a burden for somebody, what well, we're obligated in the spirit to do, we're obligated then to pray that through. We're obligated to get down on our knees and seek the face of God until the Lord lifts that burden. And when he lifts that burden, all that lets us know is whatever the situation, the Lord's going to take care of it. 
That person may have just found out they've got cancer. That person may have just found out their spouse wants a divorce. That person may have just found out that they failed in school. That person may have just lost a relationship. Their child may have just died. You don't know what on earth. They could have just been involved in a car wreck somewhere. You don't know why God placed that burden on you for that person. It doesn't matter. The Holy Ghost is the nervous system of the church. And when something happens to a part of the body over here, it's the nervous system that sends a message to the brain. And the brain then tells the body how to react. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. You poke your finger on a rose bush and you don't necessarily pull your finger away like you don't see your finger just pull away from the rose bush no what do you see happen your whole arm pulls back am I telling the truth well that's funny I didn't prick my arm I pricked my finger oh but when I pricked my finger the message went to the brain hey you need to get that finger away from that thorn you're going to get hurt what happens? The arm response. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Oh, I want to tell you, when you're part of a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost-filled church, no matter what trial, no matter what temptation, no matter what struggle you go through, honey, you ain't in it alone. Hallelujah. The Word of God said, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. No matter what you're going through, somebody somewhere is getting a burden for you. They're feeling a burden for you. And they're praying that burden through. Hallelujah. If they're doing their job right, they're praying that burden through. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I've seen it so many times in my life. I'm talking about how prayer is not bound by time or space, okay? I've seen it so many times where somebody, something terrible happens and another saint, Holy Ghost filled saint, gets a burden for somebody. And they don't know what's happened to them. They don't know what's going on in their life. But they begin to pray it through. I go to Riverside Church of God. I go one Sunday for church. Maybe I just experienced something negative or hard or difficult or traumatic. And all of a sudden, here comes Sister, Sister Dow or Sister... Uh, Schmelzer, one of these other dear, precious saints of God, and they'd come over to me, and they'd shake my hand and say, do you know this week I've had such a burden for you? <laughs> no sweeter words have ever been spoken. They don't know what I've been going through. They don't know what I've been struggling with. They don't know what I'm experiencing. But they responded to the Holy Ghost laying a burden on them. And they say, you know, I've been praying for you. I've been praying for you all week. I've had a burden for you all week long. And I've been praying for you. I tell you, when I tell you how much I miss being part of a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost-filled church, this is why. I've been praying for you. I've had such a burden for you. And then there are times Somebody, you go to church and one of the dear sisters, Sister Shields, wonderful old saint of God, marvelous lady, she'd say, you know, Chuck, I've had a burden for you and I'm praying for you. And everything's been going good. I don't know what she's talking about. I haven't had any problems. I haven't had any struggles. I haven't had any troubles. I'm not quite sure what God would lay a burden on her for. And then it comes. Oh, what's that prayer is not bound by time or space. <laughs> what did Jesus say to Peter? He said, Satan hath desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. He didn't wait till Peter was going through the trial to pray for him. He said, I've already prayed for you. I've already prayed that your faith not fail. I've already prayed that you find your way back. I've already prayed that you would strengthen the brethren on your return. Am I telling the truth? So what was the Lord doing? He was praying in advance of the situation. Do you know how many times I've had somebody come to me and say, I've had such a burden. I don't know what it is, but I've had such a burden for you. And I literally had nothing going on that 
was the least bit troubling. And then Tommy, as sure as I'm alive, it would come. See, God had them praying before the trial. God had them praying before the tribulation. God had them praying before I wound up in the fiery furnace. Oh, hallelujah. God had them praying before I wound up in the lion's den. That's why I said, I'm going to tell you something. Honey, when you understand prayer, the nature of prayer, the power of prayer, then I'm going to tell you when somebody says, I've been praying for you, I am praying for you, or I have prayed for you, you're going to be grateful. Because they are storing up in heaven intercession on your behalf. And God, in His infinite wisdom, first of all, He inspires believers to do this for one another. He inspires us to intercede for one another to begin with. Then secondly, when we do, He puts that prayer in a bottle like a perfume and He sets it up on the counter and says, okay, now when Chuck hits this trial that's about to come his way, I'm going to open that up and I'm just going to sniff on the prayer of the saints. Hallelujah. I'm going to let the intercession of those that love him and those that care about him and those who embrace him and who are part of his family of faith, I'm going to let that intercession bless me and then I'm going to respond. Oh my goodness, have mercy. Oh, I'm telling you, doesn't prayer sound like a whole lot better a thing now when you think about it in these terms? Mm -hmm. Glory to God, amen. Oh, I want to tell you today, saints, when we question the validity or the value of prayer, it's important to remember that the Lord himself has said, I have prayed for you. If the Lord prayed for us, how much more ought we, ought we to value the benefits of prayer one for another? Prayer is not always an after-the-fact exercise. The Lord spoke to Peter of his praying before Peter's trial. Too often we don't think to pray for one another unless and until something has happened. But prayer is not bound by space or time. Prayer and intercession on behalf of others is often stored by the Lord in heaven and it is later accessed when the saint is facing trouble. In Revelation 5 and 8 says, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors or perfumes, which are the prayers of saints. In Roman, excuse me, Revelation 8 and 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Revelation 8 and 4 says, And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. So see, our prayers sometimes are stored up. The Lord puts them, as it were, in a little vial and says, Chuck's going to need these after a while. Hallelujah. Oh, thank the Lord. Thank God prayer is not bound by time or space. The greatest power in prayer lies in understanding that it is substantive. You hear me? Prayer is substantive. People say, well, I'm praying for you. And others say, oh, I don't mean nothing. That don't amount to nothing, honey. When Peter and John were going into the temple through the gate that's called beautiful, a lame man was there looking for alms. What did Peter say? He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. He said, I may not have gold and silver, but I have something substantive to offer you. Oh, hallelujah. But such as I have 
He didn't say such as I believe. No, he said such as I have, give I unto thee. Oh, he said, I've got something I can give you. It ain't silver and it ain't gold. But he said, I've got something I can give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Hallelujah. Woo. So I've got faith. I believe God is a miracle working God. God's given me power to tread upon serpents. He commanded me to go out and preach, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. I got something to give you. Hallelujah. May not be money, but I've got something to give you. When you understand that prayer is substantive. Oh, it is not just words into the air. You're not just speaking words into the air, not by a million miles. You are creating a perfume which God in turn is storing up in heaven. Glory to God, amen. One of the most wonderful things about being part of a spirit-filled church is hearing a fellow child of God say that they've had you on their heart and they've prayed for you. So often when we hear such words, it has nothing to do with something that has already happened or something that is happening, but rather it may well have to do with something that is yet to occur. I remember my Aunt Dorothy, I'm almost done today. I remember my Aunt Dorothy years ago, she said, for some reason she had Sister Dow on her heart. Now Sister Dow, she was kind of one of our spiritual powerhouses in our, in our church, Riverside Church. Sister Dow, I mean, this lady, she an old-time Pentecostal holiness lady, you know. But I'm going to tell you, that little lady knew how to pray. You, you get Sister Dow praying for you, and I'm, the devil was running before she ever hit her knees. That lady knew how to touch the Lord. You needed a prayer, and you wanted that prayer answered, and you wanted God to move on your behalf. This lady lived right, acted right, and prayed right. Hallelujah. And one day, Aunt Dorothy said, I felt a burden for Sister Dow. She said, I didn't know why. I couldn't imagine why. She said, but I felt this heavy burden. She said, so I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed for her. She said, then I called her on the phone to tell her. I said, Sister Dow, for some reason, I've just had you on my heart so heavy. I, I had to pray for you because I just felt such a burden for you. <laughs> And there's Sister Dow, you know, she's the spiritual powerhouse. My aunt, you know, she ain't nobody special in the church. She's, she's not, you know, one of the well-known, uh, you know, uh, prayer warriors and what have you. And Sister Dow's like, oh, well, that's, that's nice. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, you know, I, I can't imagine what it would be for, but, you know, because everything's fine here and everything. My kids are fine. My husband's fine. Everything's good. And, but, well, that's good. Thank you, Sister Overton. I appreciate that. And they hung up the phone. And my aunt said, boy, did I feel stupid. She said, I felt like, boy, Lord, I must have missed something. Because Sister Dallas said everything's good and everything's fine and everything's dandy. About two hours later, Sister Dow called my aunt. She said, Sister Overton, she said, I got to tell you something. She said, you cannot even know how much your call meant to me. She said, not long after we hung up, I got some news that was devastating, absolutely devastating. She said, and I immediately, upon hearing this news, immediately I remembered, Sister Overton just called me and said she's had a burden for me, and she's been praying for me. She said, I want to tell you something. She said, knowing that somebody had been praying for me, gave me strength and gave me encouragement and helped to buttress me up so that I could handle receiving the news that I received. Do you see what I'm telling you? Prayer is not confined to time or space, folks. Oh, I want to tell you today.
going into a trial or a tribulation knowing that others, someone has already stored up prayers on your behalf can be immensely encouraging and heartening. In James 5, 16, the word of the Lord says, as I quoted earlier, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Prayer ought to be the natural response to hearing one admit a fault or a weakness, not criticism, not condemnation or unsolicited advice. If there's anything I wish I could get through saints' heads, it is nobody needs your unsolicited advice. Somebody says they have a weakness, they have something in their life. We've got a, an individual that I know who is struggling with alcohol addiction. Addiction is not an easy thing. This particular individual struggling with it. She said to me one day, thank you so much for not judging me, you know, not uh, having a bad attitude toward me because I've confessed to you that I have this struggle. Why in the world would I? Why would I? That's not how believers are supposed to act. Amen. Somebody comes to you and says that they're gay. Somebody comes to you and says that they have an issue in their life. They, oh, instead of going into judgment mode, instead of going into criticism mode, instead of going into condemnation mode, wouldn't it be nice if you just pray for them? And I'm going to tell you a little secret. God may answer their prayer a whole lot different than you would pray. You're praying God makes them straight and the Lord instead helps them to come to terms with who they are and helps them to understand His grace and helps them to reconcile their faith with their humanity. Hello now. Oh my goodness. And you sit there thinking, oh, my prayer failed. Oh no, honey, your prayer didn't fail. Your prayer worked. The only problem is you were praying for one thing when the will of God was something different. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something. I know that I am where I am today and I'm doing what I am today because of the prayers of people who were praying for me all the while thinking that God would do something else. Do you hear what I'm telling you? <laughs> oh, they were praying for me. Oh, Lord, help Chuck. Oh, Lord, fix Chuck. Oh, Lord, do thus and so. And the Lord said, okay, I will. And in 1993, he set me back in the church and he got my feet on solid ground and he restored me to a relationship and a walk with him. And he put me right back in the Holy Ghost filled ministry. Hallelujah. Oh, and all the while they're looking and saying, no, Lord, that's not what I was asking for. He said, oh, yes, you were. You said help him. You said help him to find my will and to find my purpose in his life. Hello now. Everything you said, I've done. The problem is, you thought you knew what I wanted for him. But you know what? When Peter was headed toward failure, I didn't pray for Peter not to fail. I prayed that his faith would remain intact. Hallelujah. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? Amen. Praise God. Amen. There are probably people out there. Tommy, you probably got family members, grandmas and aunts and uncles who for years have been praying for you. They don't realize their prayers have been answered. They don't realize God's answered their prayer. And if the new they still think that it hadn't happened. But God has answered their prayers. Hallelujah. You have found your way. Glory to God. Oh, I want to listen to me today. Instead of injecting ourselves into any situation, we are always to invite the Lord into that situation and allow Him in His infinite wisdom to execute an effective and lasting resolution. The five most powerful words on prayer that the Lord ever spoke were simply this. 
I have prayed for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon?